this morning, so, so it really brings me on to the first presentation of the day. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Emily Ford and uh, Neil Scanlon. Um, Emily is Director of uh, Interior Architecture at uh, Architects Lewis and Hickey, and Neil Scanlon is a Senior Engineer at RSP Consulting Engineers. Uh, Lewis and Hickey and RSP Consulting Engineers form part of the, uh, the design team on the refurbishment project uh, of our main library. Uh, it was mentioned by, by Angus uh, as, as the, the largest building uh, in, in the central area. So this is a long-term project uh, and it was felt you know, the university couldn't uh, operate without a central main library, so it's been a phased uh, uh, exercise in an occupied building and I'm sure that will sort of come out in, 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 in the presentation. What I would like to say is that uh, back in the days when funding perhaps wasn't quite as constrained as it is now, um, I did get the opportunity to install uh, heating and cooling infrastructure around our George Square area. There's about 100,000 square metres of building in that, in, in that sort of zone uh, and, and the vast majority of it now is connected up to our district heating and a district cooling plant. Um, uh, and, and a good bit of it uh, uh, was built in the 60s uh, and 70s uh, and was all electrically heated. So not all that clever from a carbon footprint point of view. Um, so I'm pleased to say that uh, you know, as we're developing these buildings, including the main library, uh, we're now able to connect up to uh, that infrastructure that was installed about five years ago uh, and to provide a low carbon solution uh, to these buildings as we go on. But that's uh, probably enough from me. I'll hand you over to Emily and Neil. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for ask us along to have this wee chat. Um, I'm going to do the architectural part, a bit of uh, just the background of the building. If I can just get this working correctly. That's us. Right, here's the building. That's actually when it was uh, originally constructed, so the trees are substantially smaller than they are now. Um, basically, as, as David has said, the, the university had carried out a review uh, to see how they were going to proceed with this building and how they were going to repair the condition of it bearing in mind that it had been built uh, in '67, and um, also how they would uh, analyse the building usage and how they would take that forward to make it a more useful building to them. Let's move on to the next slide. So um, that was done in about 2004. We were appointed as a design team in 2005. Um, uh, just in 2006, but already in the process, was a review of all the buildings on this campus relating to uh, listings which obviously has quite a major effect on what we can do or not with them. Uh, at this point, this, this building was uh, A-listed, along with one other building on the campus, along with the podium, which is the area that sort of links all the buildings together. Um, you can see it's a substantial floor area. I think it's just under an acre per floor. Deep plan, that standard sort of library type of uh, uh, construction, where you've got the books in the central core and the study areas around the outside. Um, and certainly the listing was going to give us some restrictions on A, what we can do for the user space and how we're going to deal with it, but also linked in with that with the, the services. Why do you develop? Well, these are, here are some of the main points. Clearly it was inefficient in the energy terms, as David said, the electric heating. Um, they had tried quite hard in the original design to put in some element, I'll probably be using the wrong terminology here, of, sort of air conditioning. They had Double, double glazing, but just of what was available at the time uh, and such like. So they had tried their best to, to, to make it reasonably efficient, but clearly it's not as efficient as it could have been. They had issues with it, just with the age of it, the water ingress to the building, uh, leakage. There'd been intentions to build further floors to the building, which had never happened. And I think maybe some of that had related to the sort of temporariness of the roof and, and the idea that they would be adding extra floors, and of course they never did it. Um, advances in user requirements, it's really been a, a bit of a revamp from the design point of view architecturally in the sense of it's just not what it's shown there. Yes, they're studying, yes, there's lots of books in there, but there's so many other facilities that need to do. There's teaching, there's different types of spacing, there's meeting uh, and all these sort of facilities, not to mention all the data, the IT and all the sort of high technology that they need to, for people to, to do what they want to do and study as they want to study. And clearly the last one, asbestos, was a big issue. Um, mostly 
it's probably thought to be related to purely the services, but because there's special collections in this building, in other words, valuable collections, there's been quite a lot of asbestos used for fire protection for these, these areas, not just the normal, you know, round the pipe lagging and all these sort of things. So these were clearly issues that had to be dealt with. So these are the proposals which are really fully comprehensive, outside and inside, addressing the energy issues and you know, trying to reduce the impact on the environment. It's a big, big building, a lot of people in it, very heavily used. Complete the fabric repairs, making it wind and water tight, making it a bit more efficient on the insulation uh, side as well. Um, amending the layout, as I say, just to give the very different spaces that you require to provide what people need to study these days, which is a mix of spaces. Um, certainly to remove the asbestos from the building. And I think the critical one here, which David touched on, is the fact that we couldn't, because of the size, we just couldn't physically decant that amount of books, study areas and whatever into another building. So it's been a phased project, and Neil will come onto this in maybe in a bit more detail, but um, that's made it very complex, to, to put it simply. We didn't even start at the top and work down the building, so we've been jumping about on floors slightly political one in the sense that we started on the top. They then wanted to do the ground floor because they wanted to show people that there was a, something going on that was exciting, that the upper floors were slightly more back of house, and they wanted them to see that and you know, make a statement. So we then had this issue that we were trying to service all these different floors, some on the old system and some on the new system. One of the plus points of this building has been that the, large, the risers are fairly substantial and that has actually given us the ability to do that without just taking up a whole lot more floor space to have temporary services running up and down the building. Right, I'll hand you over to Neil for the more technical stuff. Hello everybody. Um, my part of the presentation I will be focusing on giving a brief summary of the services within the library focusing on what formed part of the original installation and what we've got now or a before and after. <coughs> By going through this, I'd like to show the improvements that's been made with the new system against the old system and ultimately how these improvements have reduced the CO2 output and the energy consumption of the library. Start off with the original central plan. Uh, a major part of the central plant was the ventilation. The library was and still is a fully ventilated building. This was originally done by two fans located within the sub basement. Each of these fans were actually rated at 40 metres cubed a second, giving a total flow rate of 80 metres cubed a second. It's worth noting that this flow rate of 80 was actually a mixed flow rate. Of that 80, only 14 metres cubed a second was fresh air. That roughly provided 7 metres per second per person based on the original occupancy. Um, this fresh air actually mixed with the return air as an early form of heat recovery, which you know, is not too bad in the day. Um, once the air had actually passed through the fans, it was conditioned, it was cooled, it was filtered, it was humidified bef before being sent back up to the floor plate to condition the floor. Again, over the time for the library, it's been built for some time now, uh, additional air handlings were added to the second floor. This was mainly to accommodate the introduction or the increase in student numbers. Uh, these were added on the second floor and um, were used to supply the second floor and first floor with additional ventilation. The extract to the building was done by a single fan. This fan was located in the basement, um, it was located in the loading bay. There was nothing fancy about this fan, it was basically a box fan, on in the morning, off at night, and that was about it. Uh, the only other central plant within the building originally was the chowers. There was three chowers located on the roof of the building. Each of these were rated at 677 kilowatts. These supplied chilled water, which was piped down in the basement, where again it conditioned the supplier from the fans before being sent back up to the floor plate. As, uh, if you look at a, a floor before, how the services were done, and as <coughs> David mentioned earlier, the heating was actually done by electric underfloor heating, which I'm told was a normal approach in the 60s, but slightly before my time. Um, in addition to the electric underflow heating, there was actually electric reheat batteries. These were just used to temper the supplier from the conditioned plant before going into each of the floor spaces. Um, as I said, it was a fully ventilated building. Uh, the ventilation actually done the air conditioning to each of the floor plates. And the conditioned air was actually supplied through the light fins. And the light fins were perforated and were ducted back to the, the central plant. Um, we've actually got up there a, a section of the record drawing. I'm sure if you look at it long enough, you'll see the, the supplier coming through the light fins. The 
Light fittings were also used for returning the air also. Space uh, there from the actual floor passed through the light fittings into the ceiling void which was used as a basic return air cleaner, which was then ducted back to the central plant. Uh, like the air handling units, spot cooling was added on various floors over time. This was again to accommodate the introduction of IT equipment within the library, your, your PCs, your, print, your printers. Uh, this was done by chilled water fan cooling units, which basically connected them to the existing chilled water system. Uh, the only other thing to mention on the, floor, on the floor plates was the lighting. These were T12 uh, linear fluorescent light fins, and one of the main things to note in here, they were just switch controlled, either grouped or locally, so yeah, I switched them on or switched them off. There's no real control system there. Um, this is just a quick slide, it's showing a typical floor before the refurbishment. Um, it's quite dull, dingy, uh, not ideal for studying, if you ask me. I don't know if Emily wants to say anything about Well, this. I think you can see there that actually there's been additional light fittings added on. The flush fitting is the one that's the light fitting with the perforations down the outer edges that was allowing the airflow. Um, and you can see the existing glazing there with silver panels. And you've seen an example of how bad it was with condensation further on. But uh, we have actually reused the cell thing, which is, uh, I appreciate it's not a servicing matter, but <coughs> and the absorption of light comes into that, which is certainly, I mean, I think everyone felt it was just a very, very dark place generally, and the transformation with new light fitting, and also spacing out the shelving, spacing of the shelving was very close, has actually helped in that as well. Let's see, a picture explains a thousand words. Um, this is a schematic of the original ventilation system. What you can see, if you look at the, the central riser, You've got your fresh air getting drawn in on top of the riser, which was drawn down to the basement. As it worked its way down in the basement, it actually mixed with the return air from each floor plate, again, early form of heat recovery. Uh, it was then passed through the sub-basement fans where it was conditioned, cooled, humidified, before, seen, before being sent back up to the floor plates. Again, you've got the electric heater batteries just to temper the air for supplying into the floor. You've also got on the side there um, the old existing extract fan within the loading bay which connected into the central riser, which provided the extract for the building. Um, to assess the energy consumption of the original installation, uh, we modelled the building and the original systems using IES software within our office. Um, I'd like, like to go over what factors uh, impacted on the results, starting with the original building performance, the building structure. Uh, one of the key things which Emily stayed is the double glazing, which we did remember on each of the floor plates it was full height double glazing and it ran the entire perimeter of each floor. So with such a high U value, straight away you've got a large impact on your energy load, your heating, your cooling. Um, and also uh, early construction, the windows were quite, they weren't exactly airtight, so you had a lot of infiltration on each floor. Cold air coming into the inside, again impacting on your heating load and even your cooling load. The only other thing to mention here is the roof insulation. Uh, there was none. So again, straight away you've got a, an impact on your heating load. Other than the building structure, we can have a look at how the original uh, services impacted on the result and energy consumption. Straight away, the specific fan power. As I mentioned, these were big fans with a total airflow rate of 80 meters cubed a second. So straight away, you've got a, a huge draw on your energy just to do the ventilation. Um, also, the fans and the chillers, they were over 40 years old. So basically, they'd pass their economical life. Uh, they'd be less efficient. They'd need to work harder to maintain the same con conditions. And I'll probably keep coming back to this. Electric underfloor heating. Uh, you put one kilowatt in to get one kilowatt out. Not, not great by modern standards. I don't even think it would be looked at, to be honest. One of the key things here, this is the EPC, uh, which demonstrates, demonstrates the energy consumption in the building uh, of the original installation. So it actually gave us a rating of E+, which is poor by any modern techniques standards. This equated to 169 kilowatt hours meter squared energy consumption, again, which is really high. Again, a large part of that will be the electric underfloor heating. As I say, one kilowatt in to get one kilowatt out. A 
How did we improve on this? Well, a part of this, a key factor, our original brief was to connect into the university's district heating and cooling systems. So straight away you're reducing the energy consumption of the building. If we start off with the district heating system, uh, this comprises of CHP and boilers. And what you've actually got here is a photograph on the top right which shows the district system entering the building with a, a valve and a pump set. From this we have a constant temperature circuit which we distribute to serve the domestic hot water plant and the air handling plant, new air handling plant heating coils. We also take a compensated circuit which we go around to serve the perimeter heating. One of the key things here was the design temperatures, 80 to 60 degrees C from the turn. What we're trying to achieve at the university is a lower turn temperature as possible. The lower the turn temperature, the more efficient the district system works. Uh, going on to the district cooling system, that comprises absorption chillers and dry air coolers. The library itself is actually the hub for the district cooling system in the area. You've actually got a photograph there which shows the dry air coolers on the roof of the library. Um, the actual chillers are within the sub-basement. Uh, from this, we provide a chilled water circuit to the new cooling coils in the air it plant. Uh, again, this was the all sized on 6 and 12 degrees C flowing return temperatures, uh, but this is a compensated system, so depending on the outside temperature, the university may adjust the flow temperature again, just trying to reduce energy consumption. Um, we'll come on to in a second as well, but within each floor, the chilled water or the cooling or air conditioning is done through active chilled beams, which is basically chilled beam which takes fresh air and chilled water. Again, one of the key principles of this was the design temperatures, 14 and 17 degrees C, flow and return. Uh, two reasons for these temperatures. One, uh, the dew point for any sort of chilled water on the beam inside was about 12 degrees C, so we had to maintain it above that. We go below that, you get condensation, you get water dripping on your books or students or staff. The second reason is the return temperature. Like the, the heating, what we're trying to achieve with the university is the most highest return temperature as possible. The higher the return temperature, the more efficient the district system becomes. Um, because we were connected into the district systems, both the heating and cooling, the only central plant we, we had to provide as a refurbishment is new ventilation plant. This consisted of two air handling units located within the six floor plant rooms. Each of these were rated at 20 meters cubed a second, giving a total fresh air flow rate of 40 meters cubed a second. This was a, to provide roughly eight layers of sink per person based on the proposed occupancy or the final occupancy of the building. Um, so each of these were located on the east and west side of the risers. Each air handling unit incorporated your standard heating coils, or cooling coils, reheat coils, uh, humidifiers and your filters. Extract to the building was done by a single extract fan <coughs> or air handling unit. You can actually see that on the bottom slide. Um, it is one unit, but technically it's actually two units. Because it was a refurbishment, we were quite tight with space, so we had to double stack the units. So it's basically two units, one stacked above each other. Um, from the extract unit, we've got run around coils going to, out to both the supply units for a bit of heat recovery. And the only other thing to mention on the ventilation plant is the adiabatic humidifiers. Um, let's see. You do get slightly less control than you do with a steam humidifier, but it's energy consumption. You're not trying to boil water and flash it to steam, you're just letting the air pass over a wet cell to pick up the moisture. So it's just a, a bit of energy saving. Again, this is just a, a ventilation schematic of how the system now operates. You've got your two new supply units uh, providing fresh air down the east and west risers. Uh, you've got the new extract unit at the top again, extracting through the central risers. Again, because of the size of these fans uh, in the sub-basement, we're just going to isolate these fans and cap off the risers at the bottom. And that's just to ensure there's no mixing off there. If we take a look on a floor-by-floor -floor basis, services-wise, uh, the ventilation. Generally, each floor is ventilated through the active chilled beams, which again is fresh air and chilled water. This was done generally at every floor, with the exception of certain areas, which were the cafe, the main hall, and the exhibition space. Um, this was either due to the occupancy, uh, high fresh air demand, or basically the, the height of the spaces, which just kind of lent itself towards displacement to do the ventilation and, and the cooling. We've actually got a photograph there, which is um, taken within the cafe. On the left-hand side, you can see the displacement terminal. It's the perforated column, oval column. 
Uh, that went through some design changes with Lewis and Hickey to get something they'd like because it was quite visible. If it's me, it should be a big box, I suppose. Um, well, that's a ventilation. Uh, again, every floor, every floor is air conditioned, it's cooled. And again, this was done by the active chilled beams. Again, fresh air and the chilled water. Again, one of the reasons for this was the chilled water just helps the district system with efficiency, the higher turn temperature. The heating to each floor was done uh, just through low level temperature radiators. You can actually see them there on the right hand side of the glazing. Each of these radiators uh, were specified with low temperature TRVs. Again, I think the maximum turn is up to 22 degrees C. It's a university standard. Again, just uh, reduces the energy consumption, the heating load. Um, staying on the heating and, air con heating and chilled water, again, this was part of the brief the university provided. Uh, it's to be a two port control system. Again, you're just trying to minimise the amount of energy of pumping any water back to the central plant just to get it treated again. And obviously the, the input for the pumps will modulate up and down to meet the, meet the demand, saving a bit of energy. <coughs> As Emily sort of touched on, this is a phase building. Uh, one of the ways we uh, treated this for the commissioning purposes was the introduction of differential pressure control valves on the heating and chilled water. Basically, once we had done a floor, the building would be commissioned and you'd set the differential pressure control valve. And this would basically open and close depending on the, the pressure coming from the district system and it would regulate the water. So by the time you finish one floor, you went on the next floor, you could finish it, balance it. There's no need to go back to the other floor and readjust any commissioning stations, it would self-regulate. So it was quite good from a commissioning point of view. Uh, luminaires, uh, new lighting was provided throughout the building. These are T8 high frequency and dimmable controls. The key thing here is the control system. Um, you've got present detection and daylight sensors. So the key thing is they're only on when they need to be on. Uh, no one can leave them on, leave the building overnight. I'll just maybe add a couple oh. of wee things on that. Sorry, you know, just the, the general services. I think I, I highlighted earlier the special collections, and I think. Although this is the general servicing that we have used, we have had to put in um, archive storage, the BS5454, which was on the fifth floor, uh, and also the exhibition room and the reading room, trying to get them at a slightly lower temperature, all to do with the materials. So the archives have got the, the close control unit. So there's other sort of criteria in there that have been quite specialist that we've been trying to achieve, as well as the rest of the building. And I think is the other point on that is that with it being phased, and as time has gone on, there of course have been developments and what goes on what floor, the floors have been changed, the usage, and that's had an impact. A floor that was going to be staffed is now study or vice versa, and things have changed around. So they have had a bearing on, on the process as we've gone through it. So it's not been a case of we just designed it, that's us, we're working through it, the phasing is complex, but we can manage it. It's the fact that actually the brief has changed to a degree Partly because it has been a successful building and that's encouraged people to use it and partly just as, as you have a length of time of a programme like that, of course things get reviewed and things change, so that's had to be, there's had to be adaptations for that yeah. as well. Yeah. This is basically just a, a photograph now of a typical floor falling in refurbishment and compared to the original ones, brighter, cleaner, fresher, um, more, more attractable to study in. I mean, we tried to line up the finishes, we reused the shelving because that was a, a huge saving in, in the cost generally, get the side any service cost, but uh, uh, there was even things like the glazing, it was a substantial improvement, there have been issues with glass cracking and uh, with the solar gain, and of course with putting the appropriate glass in, we've not had that issue, so it's brought a lot more light into the building as well, so I think generally uh, people are amazed at the improvements, they are not aware of all the background servicing, uh, other than being more, much more comfortable than what they were, but uh, they're certainly aware of the lighting and, and the things that are more directly affect them, and they see a vast improvement in it, and that's why it's become hopefully the success it will continue to be. Um, this is just a quick slide to show what we have to go through for each floor. Uh, because it's a refurbished building, we've got a limited ceiling void, and we're actually putting more services in the ceiling void than the original installation. So this is a coordination exercise we went through for every phase, which just basically shows your uh, supply dot work, your extract dot work, toilet extract dot work, chilled water, heating pipe work, chilled beams and light fins. It's been a, a quite a hard installation, a tight restricted ceiling void, but so far it's been working well. It's all going to plan. Um, again, like the installation, 
to see the improvement, we modelled uh, the new installation on IES software to obtain an EPC and to assess the energy consumption. And again, we can look at some of the factors that obviously it impacted on the result. Again, starting with the, with the glazing. I say it's new double glazing provided throughout uh, with a reduced U value of 1.74, which is almost half of the original installation. Again, if you remember, it, you can see in the photograph, it's full height glazing running around the entire perimeter with each floor. So straight away, it's a big reduction in your, your heat gain, so your heat loss, sorry, and that actually affects your heat gain as well. Again, with modern uh, building techniques, the new solutions, it's more airtight, so you've got less infiltration coming in the building. Again, more cold air entering the building, putting up your, your heat load and continuing driving your system. Roof insulation, we've now got roof insulation, so it was a bonus. If we go into how the systems have impacted on the, the new energy consumption, obviously we mentioned before, straight away the district heating and cooling systems. Uh, increased efficiency, reducing the load on the building straight away. Uh, new plant. The air, new air handling equipment have generally got a specific fan power of around three and a half watts or litres a second. Uh, again, going back to the original installation, the original installation was 80 metres cubed a second floor rate, so we're sitting at 40, so straight away we've half the floor rate and we've got a more efficient system as well. Again, driving down the energy consumption. Chill beams, a uh, key thing as well was the uh, design temperatures, high design temperature, makes the district system more efficient. Uh, and also, it's not like fan coming, we've, we've got no additional fans or any motors getting driven, uh, there's, there's no moving parts within them. Quite common to all modern buildings now, uh, inverters and all the plant, all the fans, all the pumps. Uh, these were used for commissioning or used to modulate to meet the building demand. Again, just saving that little bit of energy. Uh, just mentioned the slide before, uh, the controls on the lighting, we've now got daylight detection and present detection. Again, the lights are only on when they need to be on. Uh, this is a key thing we've been working towards. This is the EPC of the new installation, new building and services. We were originally E plus before, we've now driven the building down to a B plus, which equates to an energy consumption of 88 kilowatt hours per meter squared. Uh, so from our point of view, one of the key things is this is a reduction of 48% energy consumption compared to the original installation, which for our refurbished building is pretty good. This is just a, a quick slide to see uh, ISP are carrying out the pre-AM assessment. And working with the design team, we're currently working our way towards a, a very good rating. Again, for a refurbishment of this size, it's, it's good, and it shows good investment by the university trying to achieve this. Um, that's it. hope I didn't speak too fast or mumble too much. Um, any questions at all? When was the building finished? Uh, 
you know, the benefits that we're getting from the system rather than just seeing what's the best we can get at. Because it's such a large building and it's obviously a huge court, it's very heavily used, it's open 22 hours of the day, it's open over the most I think we were hoping for the I'm hoping for 24 hours in advance to reduce it. But it's extremely heavily used. So it obviously appears to be extremely efficient if you're going to have a building open that length of time. How do you achieve your conditions. Sorry? How did you achieve your outcome conditions? You're then a separate plant. They're on a separate plant. You've got a, a separate uh, supply that provides 10% of the average, I think it's 10%, uh, just enough to pressurise the room. But within each of the, the beer shrooms, depending on the size of it, you've got a de dedicated close control unit, which is a refrigerant based with unit inside and a condenser outside. Um, they've got your humidifiers, your cooling coil, electric gear batteries. Uh, Size it and what's been stored in the room. Uh, sometimes you have an M plus one strategy. If it's a small room, you have a single unit. If it goes out, it needs to get addressed. But if you've got larger rooms with you know, sort of valuable artifacts, you may have two to three units. So if one unit goes down, they've still got a degree of control. And are they in your model? Uh, yes, they're, they're part of the model. Uh, but what you can do is you can almost classify that as process uh, engineering. Um, Jim, you were Um, T8 lighting is a better generation of lighting than uh, You've only gone four floors so far, I think. Uh, no, we've done six. Yeah, I think, I think it's, I mean, there's been issues, for example, even just with um, building regulations changing and the time that we have been through the building, and all these things have an effect. So even some of the, the planning of spaces has been slightly different in different six floors to what it is now. And then obviously, I think, to be honest, even the original calculations were based on certain air supplies, and that has been increased, I think. Mm. So that has had its implications to be calculated on the basis of the number of people, and therefore, that actually, the regulations have now changed, and each floor is getting filled in warrants for building regulation approval floor by floor. Mm. So that, there's benefits of it being a longer term because we can refine things and if something doesn't work in a sense more maybe slightly from the user, we can do something about that. But the downside is that uh, other things change as well. Yeah. 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 I mean certainly in the library, the, just even having them on um, the light <coughs> and stuff, you would have what they had previously was got racks and racks of shelving and had we pull cords put the lights on. But you can imagine, you know, there could be at a quiet time there's nobody in the shell but the hours and hours on end. The building's open and of course the lights go off, so that's fine. And then they just walk in and when they go and you can see what they're looking for. Okay, we'll uh, wrap it up there. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thanks for your time. We appreciate you for uh, having a great you're aware where the exhibition is if we could all uh, there's coffee down there so I'm afraid that if you want a cup of coffee you've got to go down to the uh, to, to the exhibition uh, if you could come back here please for 11 15 right okay uh, we'll, we'll we'll kick off with uh, the next couple of sessions okay thank you